all the young people are being dismissed. If you are kindergarten through fourth or fifth, whatever your parents deem there, we look, welcome you to go back to the children's class. I'm so grateful for the Evens being faithful to teach that and give us an opportunity to learn. In Judges chapter 4. We're currently living, I think we'd all agree, in some scary times. Russia attacking Ukraine. Canada becoming basically the People's Republic of Canada, where a prime minister is morphing into a dictator. Our country's leaders seeming to support that, or supporting him. Our freedoms uh, we've seen disappearing over the last few months, couple of years. But I have a message today from God's Word that I think will lift your spirits, and, and especially as a child of God, we are not the first, nor will we be the last, to see political uncertainty. And I want to always encourage us as children of God, as people of God, as Bible Baptist Church, to put our faith in something greater than man-made uh, devices. Our deliverance, friends, will not come from Air Force One. Amen? It's going to come from a higher place. And so we want to see that in God's Word today. Now, in the text we're about to read, Israel was in dire straits. There seemed to be no hope for them. Their concealed and open carry permits had been revoked. All their weapons had been uh, confiscated. They are in deep trouble. But then God steps in. And I, I want to remind you today and show you from the Word of God, there will ne- we will never be in a predicament that God cannot improve it if we bring Him in on the picture. May I remind you what Proverbs chapter 1, verse 21 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he turneth it whithersoever he will. I want to look at a story in the Bible that just shows us again and reminds us that the Lord is in control. Let's look at chapter 4. Turn me down just a smidgen, if you would, please, Caleb. Chapter 4. And the Lord discomfited... Oh, verse 15 is where we're going to start at. And the Lord discomfited Sisera. Judges chapter 4, verse 15. And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his host with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. But Barak, uh, pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Harasheth of the Gentiles, and all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Albeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazer and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. When he had turned in unto her and to the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Again he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, Is there any man here that thou shalt say no? Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took an hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and flattened it into the ground, and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast, fast asleep and weary. So he died. You, you think? Okay. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temple. So God subdued on that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. That's where we're going to stop reading, but I want you to keep your Bible open because we're going to work through the whole chapter, show you some amazing things here, great story, uh, as we look at Jael and the nail. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'd help us in this time we have together. I don't want to only give a, uh, more illumination on a story or or maybe make someone aware of something they're not aware of as much as we want to grab something to apply to our life to better serve you. Help us to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, chapters 4 and 5 are parallel uh, passages to this one event, one happening uh, on this day. <clears throat> the chapter 4 is what actually happened, and then chapter 5 is the song that they wrote in reflection to what happened. Israel sometimes did that. It was their way of celebrating. If you remember after they crossed the Red Sea, in Exodus, uh, that we see that uh, Miriam, one whole chapter is Miriam's song about what happened. It was their way of celebrating uh, what God did. So let me lay out the scene here for you. Israel has occupied the land of promise, the land flowing with milk and honey. 
One of the problems with the children of Israel is they did not follow the instructions of God when they were to overtake the people in the land. They didn't always wipe them out the way they were supposed to. And often they would rear their ugly head again later to give Israel problems. And here was the king of Canaan, one who should have been conquered, uh, and now he takes them over again. I'd like for you to just imagine they had come in and taken him over and conquered him. He has risen up again and now conquered them. They probably wouldn't treat them too good after that happened, don't you think? Uh, after he retakes their, uh, or gets back over them. And so Israel has now been 20 years under his rule. And just to widen the picture a little bit, we're in the time of judges. And Israel has went through several different series of their life. We, we, uh, really they started out with, uh, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then after that, they were in the land of Egypt for 400 years as slaves. And then we saw the time of the deliverers. You have Moses that delivered them out of Egypt, and then Joshua that brought them into the promised land. And now we're in the period of the judges. This is a unique time in Israel's history. This is where they basically kind of live a roller coaster life. They are doing good for a while, serving God and then they turn to idols, and God lets them be overtaken by somebody, and they go into oppression, and then they beg God for deliverance, and God delivers them again, and they start serving God again for a while, and then they turn to idols again. It's just kind of a cycle. This is what you see throughout the book of Judges. You see that, and you think, man, what a dumb group of people. May I introduce you to Christianity in the modern day? It's not much different. Not much has changed. Now, we've heard that bad times make good men, Good men make good times, good times make bad men, and then it just starts all over again, bad men, uh, bad times making good men. Uh, this is, I think we've seen this in here in, in America's history. In fact, there's another likeness here from the children of Israel that we see in the book of Judges to us in this day. In Judges chapter 17, uh, 6, for sake of time won't turn there, but I could have half of you turn to Judges 17 verse 6. I could have the other half turn to Judges chapter 21, verse 25, and we'd read the exact same verse. Let me read it to you. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Interesting. It doesn't say they did wicked. It says they did right. This sort of speaks of a sincerity of sorts. They thought they were doing the right thing. Here, here's the problem, though, with uh, doing right in our own eyes. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. And then it goes on to say in Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. And so uh, this is exactly, by the way, what happened in Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan came to her in the form of the serpent. You know the story. And as he comes to her, he does not say, hey, Eve, I want you to do wickedly. I want you to do wrong. Who cares what God says? No, no. He came to Eve and he simply wanted her to do what's right, except she would decide what was right. Hath God said? There's nothing wrong with eating of the tree. It'll make you wise to know good and evil. And so he wanted her to change the definition of what was right and wrong. So the problem is that no man has a right to decide what is right. We have a book that does that right here. It tells us what is right. It tells us what is wrong. And by the way, God also does not judge you according to what you feel is right. God judges us according to His standard, not according to our standard. It is true, every, one day, every single one of us will stand before the Lord, and He will not, it will not matter a whit if you say to God, but God, God, you don't understand. That was accepted in my culture. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Right is right, though all condemn it. Wrong is wrong, though all condone it. And we have to understand and get back to the book of what is right and what's wrong. Now here's where this gets interesting. Uh, it's the same period of time that the Bible says every man did right in his own eyes. The, this is what the what God says about it. <laughs> we won't turn all the, to all of these, but I want to just give you a few. All in the book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 11, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 7, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 12, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 1, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 1, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, if you went and talked to anybody at that time and you had a conversation with them, you know what they'd say? I'm doing good. I'm a good person. I'm doing right. 
uh, I'm uh, living a good life. And they were in their own eyes, but not in God's eyes. If, if we are doing supposed right in our eyes and evil in God's eyes, let's understand what he thinks matters, what we think does not. Not so much. And so this is what I believe is one of the things that's wrong in America today. People deciding what is right. People deciding that it's acceptable to murder a baby but hold a candle for a murderer on death row. People deciding that it is all right to throw marriage out as God ordained it and uh, change the definitions of it. People deciding that it's all right to kick God out of our schools and our institutions. And they're not doing it because we don't care what God says. They're doing it because we think that's right. You ever heard them talk about uh, uh, sometimes moralizing these things? The truth is, by the way, they also, one of the things that's tragic is how they teach our young people that they came from a bunch of monkeys and it just happened. They're a cosmic accident. Why do you expect that, uh, would we expect any different when we teach our young people that they're a bunch, they came from animals and they basically are animals, that they act like animals? A surprising thing. And, uh, it's a, it's a sad thing to see what, uh, people are doing. They, they say that our ancestors hung by their tail. My ancestors may be hung from their neck, but not from their tail. Amen. The truth is that this is not John Q. Public shaking his fist at God. It's not uh, saying I'm intentionally going to be wicked. He's saying I'm doing right, but I'm doing right in my eyes. And no person, no people, no nation has a right to decide what is right and wrong. God's word does that. So self-examination often leads to really bad eyesight. Uh, let me give you an example. Al Capone. Al Capone was a gangster responsible for many brutal acts of violence in Chicago. The most famous was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre where he ordered the assassination of seven and many more were killed. This is, though, what he said about himself. I have spent the best years of my life giving to people, helping them have a good time, and all I get is abuse, the existence of a hunted man. It's amazing how we see ourselves, isn't it? We had better evaluate ourselves by this book, not by what we think and how we feel. But that was what was going on in the book of Judges. Well, after 20 years, God finally enters the scene here. And by the way, we learn through our life that he, sometimes it seems like God's late. He isn't. He's always on time. But, you know, often we're in a hurry and God's not. It's a frustrating place to be in. And so he finally shows up here and he works through Deborah, who judged Israel during this time. Now, I need to stop for a minute here. <clears throat> because we read that story and we think, it, with our framework, with our mindset, in the day and era that we live in, we think, oh, look, they had a female judge for once. That was not the case in this day and age. In this time, this would have been a shocking thing that a woman would judge Israel. Women were uh, not much more than property in this time uh, that he lived in. You had one job, and that was basically to make babies. That's why it was such a devastating thing when they were barren. We see different ones, Rebecca, wife of Jacob, and, and uh, Sarah, wife of Abraham, when they were barren, how, how awful that was. And you might look at that and say, that's just terrible. And yes, but can I remind you the best thing that ever happened to women in the history is Jesus Christ and Christianity? That's the best thing that ever happened to women. In fact, you look at any place even today in the world where uh, in the absence of Christianity, there's still tremendous oppression against women. If you look at places like Islam and dictatorships like North Korea. And so Christianity does that for you. But the men of Israel had given up. They were defeated. Evidently, there was not a man among them that had enough gumption to stand up and lead. And there's a reason for this. You can't really blame them because here the Bible says in verse chap chapter 5, verse 8, that all their weapons were gone. It says here there were 40,000 men of Israel and not one sword or a shield. And so you remove a people's weapons and it, it cripples them. It wasn't a man ready to stand up. Meanwhile, Sisera had 900 chariots of iron. History tells us that uh, they had blades in the axles and, and when they would mo go through crowds of people and into battle, they would just mow down soldiers by the hundred. And 900 chariots, by the way, Exodus tells us that Pharaoh only had 600 in the army that pursued Israel when they left the promised land, or they left uh, Egypt. But God used Deborah. To be sure, Deborah would have some difficulty being a woman in that time and trying to encourage men to do the right thing. But when God has his hands on you, when he has his power behind you, it doesn't matter who you are, 
It doesn't matter the handicap that's a part of you. You uh, have uh, people will recognize the power of God on your life as they did in verse 5 here. It says that they came to her, uh, chapter 4, verse 5, for judgment. What every nation needs, what every people needs, what every church and every family needs is someone who will remember God. Here where there were men they're walking around with their heads down and they were defeated. And here's a woman that says, hey, there's still a God in heaven and we're going to see him do a mighty work. She called on a man named Barak. He was the general of the army here. She calls Barak and says, uh, God has told her and she's instructing him, assemble an army of 10,000. Now think about this, no weapons. But I want you to assemble an army of 10,000 and start a marching towards Mount Tabor. But when God says it's time to fight, whether we have weapons or not, we need to put up our dukes and get busy. Amen? We just need to obey Him. They would face 900 chariots, the many thousands of men that came with that, and they had no weapon. With God on our side, we are never in a minority. God plus one always equals the majority. In fact, He doesn't even need the plus one, but thank God He does keep us involved. And there's another thing for us to remember. If you are on the side of God, that's the important thing. Somebody told Abraham Lincoln while the Civil War was going on, I hope God is on our side. He says, no, it's much more important that we be on the side of God. If we're on the side of God and we have an enemy, then they're God's enemy too. Amen? And he can handle enemies. It's shown in all throughout the Bible. Brock, I won't go unless you go, he said. Uh, his hesitancy, we see this uh, throughout here in, in uh, verse 8. I'm not going to go unless you go. Now, I don't believe that this is a mark of cowardice so much as maybe a little bit of a lack of faith. He thought that Deborah's presence would ensure God's presence. But Deborah has just told him in verse 7 that I will deliver him into thine hand. Barak, I'll give him to your hand. Now, is this something that you struggle with in your life, friend? Are you guilty of riding on someone else's coattails in your Christian life? At some point, we have to get a hold of God ourselves. And I'm glad that uh, Barak was somewhat willing to go, but he uh, should have claimed God's promise on his own. He wouldn't have had to have her go with him. It really doesn't matter where mom and dad are, where our grandparents did. What matters is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Deborah tells him, I'll go with you. But now you'll lose your honor. Verse number 9 talks about this. So the honor, she said, that was going to be given to you is now going to be given to a woman. Hold the presses. Another woman enters the picture in this story. Again, not shocking to our time, but in their time, this is huge. You already have a woman leading the army. Now you have another woman that gets credit for the victory? It's a terrible thing for him to deal with. He had to follow a woman, lead men into battle with no weapons, and if by some God-ordained miracle they win the battle, he doesn't even get credit for it. He goes to another woman. It's a hard thing for him to do. But here's what I like about Barak. He still agrees to go fight. Uh, he, even though he's not going to get the credit, he still goes to battle. Would God that we would have more people in God's army today that would be willing to serve in their place without the credit? Uh, the uh, great president Ronald Reagan had a plaque on the desk in his Oval Office. It said, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he does not mind who gets the credit. Oh, how true that is. So true in Christianity too. What are we so worried about getting the credit for? Here's a rule that to live by that I found this week. I thought this was so good. Live so that others get the credit, God gets the glory, and you get the joy. That's a great way to live, isn't it? Instead of always making sure we get the credit. Barack would go to battle. Even if a woman would get the credit, he still went. What could we accomplish? What could you accomplish if you wouldn't worry about who gets the credit? So, on with our story. God says, take these 10,000 men up to Mount Tabar. In verse 7, he tells them that I'm going to bring the enemy to you. Now, this is a pretty fascinating point here in this story. You don't have to find your enemy. I'll bring them to you. Not only that, I'll bring you your enemy at a disadvantage to them. This is good stuff. So God set them up and brought their enemy to them and brought them in. They were at a higher ground. The enemy was in an inferior position. So God put them in a superior position then brought their enemy to them. And that's, by the way, that's what God does in your life. That's what he wants to do. He wants to set you up for victory. He doesn't want to set you up for failure. He wants to set you up to be victorious in your Christian life. 
1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Jesus Christ, or our Lord Jesus Christ. So Deborah, Barak, and their thousand are uh, begin their march towards Mount Tabor. Now, kind of like some of the movies we see today, we're going to leave them marching Mark Tabor, uh, to Mount Tabor. And then the Bible gives us this little intermission, this little footnote, kind of like maybe a flashback before we get to where they're at again. And it says here in verse number, <coughs> excuse me, verse number 11, read it with me here. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent into the plain of Zanon, which is by Kadesh. All right. And then verse 12 goes right back to our story. But verse 11 is important. It's going to set up something that's going to happen in a little bit. This is talking about Heber. And the Kenites are an interesting people. They're descendants of Hobab, which is the father-in-law of Moses. They are God believers. They believe in the Lord. They believe in the one true God. And, uh, they were, but they also got along with Jabin, the enemy. They were, uh, tried to, they were compromisers, essentially. Verse 11 tells us, though, that Heber had severed himself from the Kenites. I find this interesting. I think we'll see in a little bit, this is a little bit of speculation on my part, but I think we see some evidence of this later. It seems to me that he and his wife were aligning themselves with the people of God. No longer did he say, are we going to associate with people who are trying to hold hands with the world? They're trying to hold hands with God. They're trying to keep their foot in both camps. They're trying to uh, make friendly over here and make friendly over here. Somewhere along the line, we have to choose with who we're going to stand. It's like the guy that fought in the Civil War, wore a blue shirt and gray pants, didn't want to choose sides. He got shot at by both armies, amen? That's what happens. we got to choose a side. And here, Heber seems to be doing that. And I want to say today, God's people ought not attempt to be the same as the world around them. We ought to feel out of place in dens of iniquity when it comes to a bar or a club. You ought to feel as out of place as a ham sandwich in a synagogue. You should not fit in, is what I'm saying. God help us trying to dress up like the world and act like the world, adding Christian lyrics to worldly music. It has always baffled me how a church can understand that all the world has to offer is fool's gold, nothing real, and then to try to reach the people that are in the place of a world that has nothing to offer. A church wants to emulate the world, be more like the world, to take them from something that we're telling them is not the answer. It's always confused me. And I, I don't want to, I, I think that if we're going to win the world, let's not become what we're trying to win them from. Amen. Pastor Forsberg said a great uh, phrase this morning in, in Sunday school. How can we be a light to darkness if we embrace the darkness? That's a great question. How about showing them a better way? I don't get it, and I never have, but I'll assure you there's going to be a long wait before you see this preacher up here in skinny jeans. It's just uh, something I want to make real clear today. At some point in our life, we have to determine we're not going to compromise. There's got to be a line that we draw. Winter was coming on. A hunter went out to hunt in the forest, wanted to shoot a bear so that he could make a warm coat for the winter. He soon saw a bear coming right toward him, and he raised his gun and aimed it at the bear and took aim, but just before he fired, the bear said, wait, 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 why do you want to shoot me? The bear in my story talks, okay? Just stay with me. Why do you want to shoot me? He said, well, the hunter said, well, because I'm cold, and I want a warm coat. And the bear said, we all have needs. I'm hungry. Let's sit down and talk about it and see if we can't come to some kind of compromise. So they did. In the end, the bear had eaten his dinner, and the hunter was inside his fur coat. Hey, we're always going to lose out when we try to compromise. Haven't we seen that in governments? Haven't we seen that in history? We're all, and as a Christian, we're always going to do that too. It's always going to consume us and destroy us if we compromise. Ask Mr. Lot in the Old Testament. It did so for him most definitely. We need to be like Mason and Dixon. We got to draw the line someplace. Amen? Stay with me. Mason Dixon line. All right, I know we're north. Okay, but we got to draw the line somewhere. Heber, the Bible says, severed himself from a compromising crowd. I wonder if that's not just what some of us need to do today in our Christian life. By the way, just a question, and where was Sisera? I'm sorry, where was Heber when Sisera showed up to his tent later? Wasn't there. His wife was, but he wasn't. Could it be that 
Heber was up fighting with Barak. I don't know. I hope he was. It would have meant mean he, he chose the right side. But back to the story here. Verse 12. Uh, now we're back to where they were. While they're marching up to the to Mount Tabor, somebody comes and whispers to Sisera's ear and says, Hey, listen, you won't believe this, but the children of Israel have gathered 10,000 strong and they're marching up to Mount Tabor. And Barak says, Oh, really? So he gathered up his 900 chariots and off they go after him. Now the Israelites are up on the mountain. He is coming down uh, in an inferior position down there. The problem is they have all kinds of weapons. The problem is up here, Barak and his soldiers and Deborah, uh, they're in a better position, but they got no weapons. And Deborah looks down at, at Sisera and his army, and she says to Barak, it's not in exact words, but go get him, tiger. That's what she basically says to him in, uh, in our passage here. So down they march toward that army. No weapons. They got no, nothing to fight with. And there they go. Can I tell you, friends, we don't need weapons if God is on our side. He is the greatest weapon we can have with him on our side. They had, by, it's interesting, they had already obeyed God going to Tabor. When God said go to Tabor, that wouldn't make much sense. Okay, and they obeyed God. Now he says march down the mountain and attack. They obeyed here. You know, it's always easier to obey in the future if you've obeyed in the past. And especially if you obey in smaller areas, it's better to easier to obey uh, going forward. That's a great principle. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 3 through 4. Surrender ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a filthful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance. And even God with a recompense, He will come and save you. He did that here. Look at verses 5, or chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. The Bible says in verse 15 of chapter 4 that the Lord discomfited Sisera. Now that means to move noisily, to confuse, to break, to consume, to crush, to destroy, to trouble, to vex. Let's look at what it says in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 5. Lord, thou went to, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Eden, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped and the clouds also dropped water. The mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. Uh, hey, listen, what happens when the earth shakes? What happens to chariots when sheets of water fall down from the heavens? The Bible says here the mountains melted. We're talking about mudslides. We're talking about deep gorges and ditches as these uh, chariots are trying to move about and can't. Uh, they didn't have four-wheel drive chariots at that time, okay? And all of a sudden, their tactical advantage, poof, it's gone. God took care of it. Now, again, it's a little bit of speculation, but in verse 16 it tells us not a man was left. So my guess is that in the middle of the torrential rain, the darkness of the storm and the panic, <coughs> they probably fought one another. It wouldn't be the first time, and it wouldn't be the last either. It happened just several chapters after this in the life of Gideon. They're fighting one another. And uh, then as the Israelites come down, they would find weapons to use from those that had died and use them on the enemy, and they defeated them. When God gets involved, Sisera's army had no chance. Man, that's a blessing. It's a great thing to remember. When God gets involved in your struggle, by the way, friend, it also, uh, or in your problem, if you are aligned with his will uh, for your life, you are on the winning side. Let me tell you what growth is all about. Uh, we're talking about growth throughout this year. Growth is understanding and seeing what God is doing in your life. It's obeying God, and then when He grants you victory, uh, then you, excuse me, when you, when He grants you victory, your faith grows. And when your faith grows, and then you obey more. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 is a great example of this. You'll find faith inspired obedience, and then obedience inspired more faith. And on and on and on it grows. That's growth in the Christian life. Well, here's Cicero. His army is completely annihilated. There's not a man was left. He's alone. Dust in the air, noise. He must have, uh, I'm assuming, probably been back, maybe watching from a distance, the way some generals will do. And he sees his army wiped out. He's humiliated especially because his army was beaten by a woman who had an army who had no weapon. That's not a story you're going to go right and brag about. you know. And so he looks around. He decides to make a run for it. Where can he go? And he thinks, hey, the Kenites. The Kenites are friends of mine. They'll give me refuge. In fact, I know where there's one close by. I know where Heber's house is at. So he makes off for Heber's house. Heber is not home, but his wife is. Her name is J.L. And this opens the curtain to one of the most fascinating scenes in the Bible. We read about it a few minutes ago. She sees Sisera coming out of the heat. Make yourself comfortable. Sit down 
right here, she says. Here, let me move the tent stake. Sit down right here and make yourself comfortable. In fact, she said, you look tired. Maybe I can make you a cot over here and we'll lay you down. And uh, here, lay down. And she says, I got a blankie for you. That's what the Bible says. I got a blankie for you. Puts a blankie over him. Is there anything that I can do to make you more comfortable? Yes, he says, I'd like to get a drink of water. Oh, I'll do you one better than that. She says, I've got some milk for you. And she puts milk in the glass. Now, you got to forgive my imagination, but just the way that I read Bible stories and try to visualize them, I picture her with an evil glare in her eyes as she stirs them. Got some milk for you. Would you like me to warm it up for you? It'll help you sleep better. And so she gives him this milk, and uh, she gives it to them there. Now, go to sleep, and she's uh, trying to calm him down, trying to make easy. Go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep, evil tyrant. You know, she's singing to him, making it easy. Gives him the milk, takes it off, uh, puts it away. And then he says, hey, if I, if somebody comes to the door, don't let him in. Don't tell him I'm here. In a moment, he's sleeping peacefully. When he's sleeping, she goes off to the side of her house. She picks up a tent pit, something kind of like this, I'm guessing. And while he's sleeping, she quietly and stealthily comes up to his prostrate body. She puts the tent peg right on his temple. I wanted to illustrate this using a couple in our church. I asked the Grahams. Tracy was more than willing. In fact, she seemed eager to do it. Laurie wanted nothing to do with it. I don't understand what that's about. So, right on the temple, he's sleeping. She quietly puts it right there. Bam! Puts that thing right through his head. Into the floor! Nails his head to the floor with a tent peg. A woman to a general. Nails him to the floor. The Bible says, so he died. Yeah, I think he did. I think that's hilarious. She was the tent peg widow maker. Now, it doesn't tell us here, but in chapter 5, verse 26, it says that she cut off his head. Men, women are scary, amen? I mean, we already knew this to an extent. Women are really, really scary creatures. You know, I I learned this week that only 10% of serial killers are women. I think it's more. I think you guys just get away with it more. This is a scary scene. So she goes out to meet Barack. She says, I have the guy you're looking for. He's out searching for Cicero, you know. I have the one you're looking for. He's in my tent. I can see Barack. Oh, quick, guys, let's go before he gets away. No, no, I, I, I think he's going to be just fine right there. Not going to get away from me. And so they go into the house, and it says there they saw him lying there, head nailed to the floor. I imagine them looking at each other. Grinning a little bit. Here's the great sister who has been outfoxed, not by his the general Barak, but by a nomadic tent dweller. To top it all off, a woman. What a story, huh? That's an exciting story. You don't have to go further than your Bible to see some really exciting stuff, interesting stuff. But I want to look at it a little bit from JL's point of view. I doubt very highly that she got up that morning and says, well, I got my tent stake, I got my hammer. With any luck, I'll be able to drive this through some guy's head today. Don't think that was in her plans. In fact, she was just going through her ordinary day. Uh, The truth is that the opportunity to do great things in our life often happen during the ordinary. Just our ordinary run-of-the-mill obedience. J.L.'s day was going along in an ordinary way. And then into her life walked Sisera. And all of a sudden, everything changed. I'm sure she probably recognized him (coughs) or learned very soon who he was. He would have been dirty, exhausted, probably half naked, probably lost many of his clothes in the scramble and the fight to get there. And uh, all of a sudden, everything changed for her. As she ga- as he gasped out his story, she began to formulate a plan in her mind. He's looking for a place to hide. She offers it to him. He needs some water. She offers him some milk. And soon he is sleeping soundly. Could it really be this easy? And yet, Sisera... Uh, who had been a thorn in the side of Israel for so long. He had been the reason that they were oppressed and they had went through so much difficulty. Of all people, she suddenly realizes she could be the one to put an end to all that tyranny. And She jumped on the opportunity. Walter P. Chrysler said the reason that so many people never get anywhere in life is because when opportunity knocks, they're out in the backyard looking for four-leaf clothes. We're hoping luck changes our uh, life instead of jumping onto opportunity. Very often we have to make our own opportunities. Well, sometimes they just show up. Jael knows what she's going to do. As soon as she hears 
him snoring, she picks up the tent peg and the hammer and goes to work. And by the way, these were common everyday tools. She just did what she, she used what she had at hand. She didn't have to go to some university to learn how to kill generals. Uh, by the way, tent, put, putting up tents and moving those things, that was woman's work at that time. And so she was just doing, using what she was very familiar with. And she was going to get the job done for God. When God breaks in on your ordinary, it becomes or can become extraordinary. An ordinary day turns extraordinary when the apostles went fishing and caught enough fish to sink a ship because Jesus showed up. An ordinary day turns extraordinary when a mama packs a boy's lunch to go off uh, for the day and his lunch feeds 5,000 men and their families because Jesus showed up. An ordinary day turns extraordinary when a sick woman, sick for so many years, reaches out and touched the hem of our Savior's garment. When Jesus showed up, He made a difference in her life. J.L. just goes about her normal routine, but when Sister shows up, changes her life forever. God uses ordinary people to do His greatest work. That's almost always how He does it. He wants to use you. He wants to use each and every one of us <coughs> in some special way. It may not involve something extreme as J.L. I hope not. Uh, I don't want to make those visits. I don't want it to happen when I'm on a visit. For sure not, amen? The key is to be prepared for what God may send your way. Now, how do we do that? Well, uh, number one, we have to be available to be used. What's the best ability class? Availability. That's the best ability. Uh, we have to be available for God to use. And God always uses people who are willing to do something for His glory. In an army full of people that were trained to do military battle, no one was available to fight Goliath, but an untrained young 17-year-old shepherd boy who just showed up on the scene to bring his brother some cheese curls and, and corn chips. It, he uh, just showed up, and but yes, guess what he was? He was available. And God said, I need somebody to fight the giant. Saul said, not me. Saul's general said, not me. All the soldiers down the line said, not me. He's scary. David said, I'll go. I mean, I fought a lion before. This shouldn't be a big deal. I can throw rocks with a piece of rubber. Shouldn't be bad. I'll do it. And God used him because he was available. I'm asking today, friend, are you available? Just available to be used of God. Number two, we need to be faithful, looking for opportunities to do something for God. Jael saw the chance to do something for God and her people. She took decisive action, and friends, she set Israel on a path of ridding itself of the Canaanites. Verses 23 and 24, we see it. This was the beginning of their total victory over the Canaanites. God specializes in taking the ordinary and making something extraordinary happen. He's done it before. On an ordinary day, a carpenter from Nazareth was crucified on an ordinary cross. He was hanged between two ordinary thieves and placed in an ordinary tomb. But three days later, he did something that was anything but ordinary. Amen? He rose from the grave, and he's alive forevermore. Hey, when Jesus shows up, uh, good things happen. One day soon, he's coming back for his church, and it will be an extraordinary day. He'll take a bunch of ordinary people to that extraordinary place that he has prepared for us. Hallelujah. Now, all that being said, does that not put a different perspective on our current troubles? I mean, it's, it's a great thing to know that God's in control. If you're stressed out by world news, all the political uncertainty of the world, take heart, dear Christian. Yes, we need to be involved. Yes, we need to desperately pray for our leaders. But maybe you could take some time this week, turn off Fox News and open the book and put some more effort and investment into God's Word, realizing that He is ultimately in control, uh, understanding that God has it uh, uh, is not taken by surprise of anything that happens. Now, you might say, you know, I know this preacher, but I'm so frustrated I see all this and I can't do anything about it. Hey, all I've got is a tent peg. That's <laughs> all J.L. had. Changed the world because she was willing to be. I don't know, friend, what God has planned for you. Maybe it's to be a Deborah. Leading others to trust God in impossible situations. Maybe it's to play the role of Barak. Fight the battle for God even though you'll get no credit. Just being faithful in the trenches, doing the work, getting the job done. Maybe it's to be a J.L., a background world role. And this turned out to be the most important one of all in this story. In the meantime, put your trust in Him. In the meantime, just be faithful. Stay in the work. 
Stay, into, uh, stay involved with the people of God in the house of God. Stay faithful. The most unlikely person in the world to defeat the mighty Sisera was a nomad woman. And she did it with a tent peg and a hammer. And he used it to change the tide of her nation. Hey, God wants to do something great through each and every one of you. <clears throat> you don't have to be in a great position. You don't have to have all kinds of knowledge and training. Just hold your tent peg and be ready to go. And God will tell you when to put it to work. Amen? Be ready to do what He wants. God still has His jail with a nail. And He wants to put them to work. Every head bowed, every eye closed. There's some visitors with us today here. And, and even this applies also to people that come on a regular basis. Maybe you're here today and you don't know for sure <clears throat> if something happened today to you. You don't know for sure if you'd be in heaven. The Bible is very clear, 1 John chapter 5, that we can know for certain that if we close our eyes in death, we can open up in heaven. We can know that for certain. But if you're here today and say, Preacher, I'm not sure. Nobody looking around. Nobody going to point you out or embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Would you slip up your hand? I'm not sure if something happened to me that I'd be in heaven. Just not sure. Thank you so much. How about you, dear Christian? Has the current state of our nation and our world caused you to shake your faith in God? Let's put it back in Him where it belongs. Stand along with me as she begins to play. Heads